you know, even the three core symptoms, you turn them on its head and you get a positive. The flip side of distractibility is curiosity, a major asset. The flip side of impulsivity is creativity, another major asset. You don't plan to have a creative idea. They pop, they come impulsively. And the flip side of hyperactivity is energy. You know, I'm glad at my age to have all the energy I've got. So embrace the condition. As I like to say, you unwrap the gift. It doesn't unwrap itself. It takes work to unwrap this gift. Welcome to Successful with ADHD. I'm Brooke Schnittman. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Successful with ADHD. Today, I have the great Dr. Hallowell. If you know anything about ADHD, you know this guy staring right in front of us. He is an expert in the field, a board-certified child and adult psychiatrist, and a leading world authority. He's graduated from none other than Harvard, and he actually worked there for 21 years as well. He graduated from Tulane. He's the founder of the Hallowell ADHD Centers in Boston, New York City, San Francisco, Palo Alto, Seattle, Metro West. He has spent over 40 years helping thousands of adults and children live more productive and happy lives with his strength-based approach, which we'll definitely hopefully talk about today. And he has ADHD and dyslexia himself. He is the leading author of ADHD 2.0 and also Driven to Distraction. He's the co-author with Dr. John Rady. I know all of you have seen this book or read it and or skimmed it. And he's also been featured in Oprah 2020, 60 Minutes, CNN, The Today Show, on and on and on and on. <laughs> and unfortunately, I don't have 30 minutes to talk and highlight all of the work that you've done because we need to get into it. But thank you, Dr. Hallowell, for being here. I know it's been a long time coming for us and you are so supportive of the ADHD community that we got on a call this morning and you said, okay, let's do it. So. <laughs> so happy to see. Yeah, no, I, I love what you're doing and it, it's tremendous. I mean, that's the the big need is to get the word out, you know, that that uh, and folks like you, uh, grassroots, that that's where it's happening. So I'm, I'm very glad to join. Yeah, you. thank you. Uh, to give any any help. I thank can. you. Dr. Hallowell turns the quote, ADHD is like having a Ferrari brain with bicycle brakes. And there have been many versions and variations of this with other ADHD people, but strengthening the brakes, you can have a champion. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you came up with that quote, Dr. Hallowell, and how that is referenced to the ADHD brain? Well, you know, early on, I, I, I learned about this when I was, uh, how old was I? <laughs> about 30 something in, in 1981 before I was, I born. was doing a fellowship in child psychiatry. I, I'd never heard of ADD up until then. It was called ADD by the way, back then. And I had a, heard a lecture in, in July of 1981, a, a really momentous moment in my life because all of a sudden it hit me. I had this condition that I was hearing described at the same time. I, I realized that the medical model, the deficit disorder model, left out all the good parts, left out the strengths. And, you know, but that's what we do as, as, as doctors, we zero in on pathology. You don't go to the doctor because you feel so good. But when it comes to the mind, it's a big mistake just to talk about pathology because we identify with our minds. You know, we, we don't identify with our kidney. If you say you have a sick kidney, the person doesn't feel personally slighted or, you know, but if you say you have a sick brain, that that's your brain is you. And so that that's, that's a, that's an insult. And so we had created a diagnosis, uh, the, the, the name of which was demeaning and uh, pathologizing of, a, of, a, of an entire person. And it would be one thing if that were accurate, but I also realized that it was completely not accurate. Even the, the term deficit disorder is wrong. We don't have a deficit of attention. We have an abundance of attention our challenge is to control it. And so I, I knew I needed some kind of metaphor, some kind of analogy that would be quick and easy to understand, but was also accurate. And I wanted the, the headline to be positive and the footnote to be negative. So it just came to me, a Ferrari engine for a brain. You've got a race car for a brain. Your brain goes lickety split, mile a minute, runaway brain. 
the problem is you have bicycle brakes. Your your braking system is not strong enough to con control this incredibly fast, powerful brain you've got. And and so you know my job is to help people strengthen their brakes so they can win races and instead of spinning out on on curves. And the beauty of that analogy is it's accurate as well as being descriptive. You know, Russ Barkley, who is one of the great researchers in the field, has conceptualized ADD. I still call it ADD, by the That's way. That's okay. A lot of people do. <laughs> Russ uh, conceptualizes ADD as a relative deficiency in inhibition. Mm. Your, your inhibitory circuits, the brain has inhibitory circuits and excitatory circuits. And in ADD, your, your inhibitory circuits aren't as active. Hence, you can't screen out incoming stimuli, which makes you distractible. And you can't screen out outgoing impulses, which makes you impulsive and hyperactive. The three sort of identifying symptoms of ADHD. That's a fancy way of saying weak brakes, deficiency in inhibition. Absolutely. Problems with inhibiting. Well, that's what brakes do. They, they inhibit the movement or they slow it down. So it's worked very well, that analogy, because kids get it, adults get it, and it's accurate. They can, and, and when someone is, is acting up, you, instead of saying you bad boy, because it's usually a boy who's disruptive, you say your brakes are failing. Mm -hmm. There's no shame in that, mm -hmm. you know? So, oh yeah, I got to work on my brain. More work on my brakes. Yeah. And I know that you quote Dr. Barclay in your book, ADHD 2.0, and talk about the 13 years less on average of an individual with ADHD. That's scary. But I also want to, since you brought him up, talk about the DMN and TPM because what you were sharing definitely appeared to me as referencing those two things and how that really impacts individuals with ADHD compared to neurotypicals. Would you mind differentiating? Sure. This is this is relatively new research, and it's um, it wasn't around when I wrote Driven to Distraction in 1994. But it's it's very exciting that we have this information now, and and it turns out when you're doing something constructive, when your imagination is engaged. It's cooking a meal, writing a paper, designing a boat, whatever it might happen to be. When your imagination is engaged, you super focus. And that, that's when we're at our best. And that's when ADD becomes a superpower. It becomes a tremendous ally because we tend to be highly creative. And, and, and our, our greatest asset, our most distinguishing feature is we have a prodigious imagination. We're often not aware of it because we've always had it and we take it for granted. But most people with ADD are extremely imaginative. Yes. So when you're using your imagination, when it's engaged, then three different regions of, of your brain light up and in, in four different regions. In, in aggregate, that's called the, the task positive network. You're positively engaged in performing a task and you focus, you fo focus really well. But when the task comes to an end, the old thinking was the brain sort of takes a rest. That's not true at all. In fact, the brain uses more oxygen when it's not in the TPN than when it's in the TPN, interestingly enough. So what lights up instead when the task positive network shuts down is what's called the default mode network, the DMN, which I call the demon because DMN sounds like demon, but it's a perfect word for it. In people with ADD, the demon tends to send out a stream of negative, horrible messages. Remember, it's your imagination. So your imagination cooks up every bad thing it can think of about you. You're stupid. You're ugly. You're boring. Your life is going to go to hell. Everything you've done is you've not made any good use of yourself. All you do is spread bad words, bad vibes. And you just, just attack yourself mm -hmm. in a way you would never attack anyone else. And, and what happens is you sit there in, in this kind of trance. It's captivating, you see. And we're always looking for a stimulation that will engage us. We're always looking for focus. Contentment is too bland. You don't say she was riveted in contentment. It's boring. And you do <laughs> say she was riveted in fear and despair and gloom and doom. And, and it's, it's absolutely captivating. So you zero in on that. The problem is it's horribly 
miserable and makes you not like yourself and not like your life and you abuse yourself just treating yourself terribly and, and it hurts you can have ptsd from beating up on yourself definitely uh, and for people with add you often have a terrible terrible self-esteem and and a lot of the worst damage was inflicted by their their own imaginations that nobody else would talk to anybody like that and it's and it's also inaccurate because we we tend to be very talented, but we tend not to give ourselves credit for that. But if you can understand that this is, see, what the mistake people with ADD make is they they take the productions of the demon, the DMN, to be truth. They think, ah, yeah, you really are a horrible person. You really are a talentless goof. You, you really have nothing to contribute. So they say, that's the truth. They believe these lies that the demon is coming up with because we're very much more ready to believe something negative about ourselves than something positive. We're, we're immediately suspicious if someone gives us a positive remark and if someone criticizes us, we say, yeah, you're right. Uh, you, I, I am a, just a rotten person. And, and that is a, it's a horrible habit that, that you want to learn to break. If, if, if you can understand that it's a function of, of biology, of neurology, that it's not truth. It's not like the God of truth suddenly visited you at all. It's, it's much more like a nightmare that your imagination is creating. Well, if your imagination created it, your imagination can destroy it. Now, how do you do that? How do you destroy something that's going on in your mind? Your mind? You redirect its attention. You redirect your attention. Instead of looking at the accident on the side of the road, you look at the cornfield on the left of the road. Now, it's hard to do because the accident on the side of the road is a lot more fascinating, but it's upsetting. Yes. So you have to learn how to redirect your attention. The minute you redirect your attention, the DMN shuts down. All the negative, the, the, the negative stuff cannot survive for a second without your feeding it with your attention. And people realize they think they don't have any control over it. They have absolute control over it. It's just that it's not easy to do. It's not easy to disengage from something that's captivating, like getting a kid to get off of a, video game, you know, video games or, you know, and, or an adult to stop watching, you know, something on TV. It, it, it's not easy to redirect your attention when you're captivated, but you can do it. And, and it's worth learning how to do that. Absolutely. And I like how you talk about, you know, of course, there's pattern interrupts, but that doesn't always work for individuals with ADHD, redirecting the attention, changing your environment, moving away from that negative thought can be so much more helpful sometimes. Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. And you were saying that when we get these negative signals, and thank you for explaining DMN and TPN, when we get these negative signals, we definitely very often believe them and that can correlate into our rejection sensitive dysphoria. You also mentioned that we don't always believe positive feedback. And I know that you termed RSE, which is recognition sensitive euphoria. Would you mind explaining that? Sure. Well, RSD, rejection sensitive dysphoria, a term that William Dodson has, has made famous is, is common in people with ADD. Other people get it too. We're exquisitely sensitive, overly sensitive to perceived criticism, uh, rejection. I say perceived because often it's not intended at all. Someone says, I, I like your dress, and the person hears it as saying, I don't like your shoes. Or, you know, they create rejection or criticism out of nothing. But again, that's the imagination at work. And, and then they go into this horrible place of feeling left out, uh, sequestered, alone, you know, once again, not in with the in crowd. I mean, just, it, it brings back all the years they've lived with rejection or perceived rejection, feeling different in a negative way. And it's a real problem. Dawson, there's a couple of meds he recommends for it, but it's, it's mostly a learning that it happens and b well if it's a creation of my imagination i can destroy it because it's not real and and that takes some practice to learn how to do that now i because i always looking for the positive i said okay if there's rejection sensitive dysphoria how about recognition sensitive euphoria 
And that's also true. We tend to be especially responsive to praise. We love it. That doesn't mean we're we're narcissistic. It's more that we're deprived of praise. We, you know, we're like the poor little flower that hasn't been watered and you give it a little water and it just brightens up. It's so happy. At last you've given me some water. Now I can bloom and, and uh, bees can feed off of me and all of that. And, and so again, it's, we get so preoccupied with the negative that we forget the positive. We need, and I, I ask for it myself. People are often taken aback because it's not, most people are not confident enough to, I'll ask, do, do you like me? You know, uh, do you like this thing I did? And they'll say, yes, I do. I said, Good. I just want to make sure. Instead of living with the insecurity, I, I, I'll ask straight out for reassurance. But in general, if you're dealing with someone with ADD, and it really, if you're dealing with anyone, pass along pa positive uh, remarks that you've heard or positive observations you have. Most people don't get enough of that adults anyway. It's a great favor you can do them. The euphoria can last a week. You know, you, you can dine out on it. You know, the, the one compliment the person gave you on the nice, the smart thing you said at the conference or the beautiful dress you're wearing or whatever it happens to be, you, you can hold on to that for a while. I encourage people to do that. Don't feel like you're being self-indulgent. You need to feed yourself, you see, and, and that's that's another term I use. You want to be able to metabolize praise, metabolize positive remarks. And what do I mean by that? I mean, just as you metabolize a tuna fish sandwich when you eat it, you break it down in your stomach into its component parts and ultimately into its various molecules, and then it passes along through your intestines and, and your body absorbs the nutrients and then they're taken through your bloodstream to every cell in your body. And that, that process of, of, of nourishing yourself uh, from food, you should be able to do the same thing with, with positive, with praise, to break it down, to own it, to metabolize it, and to let it feed you. And, and most people with ADD can't do it. They block it. They don't even let it in. It's like they've got a they've got a, a porcelain wall, you know. They know, and so the praise they say thank you, and it bounces right off and falls to the floor. I can see them doing it. I'll say, God, you're really smart. Oh, thank you. And they and think you're I lying. They, right? they haven't taken it in. Well, not even they don't even give it that much thought. Just reflexively, they they, they just don't take it in. They don't consider it. They don't own it at all. Mm -hmm. They they give me a knee jerk thank you because they're polite, but I can see it's had no impact on them whatsoever. On the other hand, if I said, "Boy, are you stupid?" they'd remember that for a long time. Absolutely, <laughs> Doctor Hallowell called me stupid. You know what a jerk he is. Right, it's a highly sensitive ADHD yeah, person. Right, yeah, exactly, exactly. But then you tell that to a neurotypical, and it might not resonate the same. Yeah, they say, they say you're stupid too. Yeah. Your mother wears combat boots, so, you know, whatever, you know, they're just the back right. and forth thing. Right. And men particularly, our way of being friendly is to insult one another. You know, how are you doing, you old son of a bitch? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so you are a leading doctor and most doctors, like you said, think about the gap rather than the strengths. I'm just curious, obviously there's a lot of different treatments out there for ADHD. What do you believe to be like the gold standard of treating ADHD? As of now, the best treatment includes diagnosis, education, coaching, and a trial of medication. Those are sort of the four mainstays. You, you, obviously you have to have a diagnosis to know what's going on. And then you want to learn about it, and hopefully you learn my strength-based approach because it's a lot more accurate and, and more emboldening. And then a trial of medication, uh, you don't have to. I mean, a lot of people get upset about meds. The fact is meds are very safe if they're used properly, but you don't have to do it. But it's it seems silly to me to pass up an opportunity to have a, an intervention that is so powerful. It makes everything else you do, all the non-medication interventions. Uh, Enhanced, yeah. And then, and then coaching, which is sort of the most effective 
uh, of the non-medication interventions, of which you, you do, is very effective is, as long as you want to do it. You've, you've got to have a coach uh, that you like and who likes you. And, and as to what coaching is, you know who invented coaching? You? Correct. I know that. <laughs> and, and, and driven to distraction. Yeah. Yes. I said, uh, people with ADD don't need a therapist, they need a coach. And some people made fun of me and saying, oh, I thought uh, that was for baseball players. I said, no, we have trouble getting out the door, not because of how our mother treated us, but because we didn't remember to put our socks on. And that what makes us anxious. We don't want to talk about it. We want to fix it. <laughs> exactly. So coaching, if it's done properly, it, a coach is pretty much what your mother used to do, do minus the nag factor. So, so a coach doesn't nag you, but a coach reminds you, helps you plan, helps you, encourages you, bucks you up, all that kind of stuff. So those four elements. But then I add a fifth one because, because I think it's so important that it, it gets overlooked. And it's, it's one that I'm really focusing on a lot these days is find a creative outlet. Most of us with ADD are creative. If we haven't found where we're creative, you should look for it because once you find it, it makes you sing. It's like discovering your violin. You have to learn, still learn how to play it. It's not easy. It doesn't play itself, but at least you know that's the instrument I should be playing. I found my violin, and then you can spend the rest of your life trying to make music with it. My violin is, is writing, and I'm still trying to, you know, I still do it, and it's still less than perfect, and I'm still trying to make it good, but, but you know, I, I'm drawn to that. But so find what you're and then because, and this is sort of a, a corollary to that statement, one of the most crippling problems in the world of ADD relates to self-esteem, confidence, and motivation. And I'm in the process right now of writing a book on how to, how to develop confidence, self-esteem, and motivation. Me too. Maybe we can collaborate. Oh, really? Yes. The manuscript's done. Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, the most reliable way to build... Uh, confidence, motivation, and self-esteem is to make progress at some task that's challenging that matters to you. It has to be challenging, and God mm -hmm. knows writing is challenging in, in my own case, and it has to matter to you, and writing matters a lot to me. And then you have to make progress at it. So, and that's, by the way, why you need a coach often to help you make progress. If all you do, if you make no progress, that breaks your self-esteem, that reduces your confidence, and it reduces your motivation. So, and it negatively feeds you. It's a vulnerable moment, but so you you want to you want to take care to make sure you do make progress. But if you do make progress at whatever this activity might happen to be, guaranteed your self-esteem will increase, your confidence will increase, your motivation will increase. And that's, that's just a wonderful feeling. I like that. And also with your strength-based model, if you know what you are naturally good at, then you can make yeah. more progress in that and focus on your strengths and feel better. <laughs> oh, and, and that's another thing. Don't spend, by the time you turn a certain age, young adulthood, it's, it's time to stop trying to get good at what you're bad at and do what you're good at. And the, the rest of it, delegate, hire out, whatever. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, don't spend your whole adult life trying to get good at what you're bad at. What is, what is your book uh, that you're writing? Yeah, sure. So I talk about the ADHD disruption, the uh, 10 disruptors. So we go from underwhelmed to overwhelmed and everything in between. So when we're underwhelmed, we're constantly seeking dopamine. So then we get an exciting new idea. We get dopamine. We hyper-focus from hyper-focus. Then we burn out because sometimes we can't manage the hyperfocus, and then we feed that rejection sensitive dysphoria, the negative thoughts, and we shut down and they get overwhelmed. So it's a cycle. How does self-esteem come into play? Sure. So I have 12 tips. So we start off small, we evaluate the areas of our life, we do a 1% action towards something that has been small, but challenging to you just to get it out of your head. We do a minds map. Then from there, we talk about value strengths and we talk about a why funnel, which is how to find out your intrinsic motivation. Now that you have all of the four other things that we talk about, then we talk about productivity and throughout 12 weeks, 
you do that 1% over and over again. And after those 12 weeks, you feel more confident because you're now able to take a task that has been daunting to you. You figured out a lot about yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, how to focus on your strengths for greater productivity. And you naturally become more confident because you learn how to break things down rather than doing things all at once. And I recommend both of your books in it for future books. Both of my books. I've written 24 books. Well, yeah, both of your 24 books. 24 (laughs) books. Right. So which ones? Someone says to me, I read your book. You know, I think, well, which one? They're usually referring to Driven to Distraction because that's probably the best known of them all. But, uh, you know, that came out a long time ago, 1994. It's crazy. That's when ADD changed to ADHD, right? 1994. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was still ADD when Driven came out, but uh, good for you. And and the way you laid it out, it, it sounds wonderful. But so you you've got a you've got a good book here now. Don't procrastinate. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. Definitely not procrastinating. I appreciate you, and I appreciate that. Okay. And just some closing thoughts. So you recommend the five things, the five gold standards for ADHD. I love the creativity one. I love the medication piece. Even if you aren't a fan of medication, fine don't do medication. You have these other four things. But with coaching, I know you said you have to have someone who likes you and you like them. And I think that's huge because a lot of people will go take a look at the name and look at the letters or see someone on social media and say, okay, they look good. Let me go with them. Or they they are a lot of money. They must be really good. How do you with the barrier to entry being so low at this point with ADHD coaching, how do you determine what or who is the best ADHD coach for someone interviewing? Well, you know, you, you, the, the click is the most important thing. If you sit down with this person and say, boy, I really trust her and I'll let her boss me around and I'll let her, you know, because giving yourself over to a coach is, is a very, you make yourself very vulnerable if you want to do it properly and get something out of it. And so, you know, am I, am I willing to, you know, have this, this person come into my, the intimate entrails of my life, all the things that I confuse and mess up. And, and do I feel comfortable with her? That's, that's the most important. Then the next most important, you, you want to ask what experience do you have? If you're the first person they're coaching, you know, you might, you might say, well, I'd rather see someone who's has a little bit more experience than that. But after all, everyone has to start somewhere. And if you really like the person and they understand what coaching is, go with that person. Liking the person is the most important. Experience is the next most important. What degree they have is irrelevant. And energy really matters. You know, they can't be too self-centered because Mm -hmm. they've got to make you the center of of attention. So are they able to do that? And when you meet with them, you know, do they ask about you or is it just they're talking about themselves? I appreciate that from the guru who invented ADHD coaching, his mouth to God's ears. (laughs) Well, you know why you know why I, I I came up with the idea and then I moved on to other things. Why I didn't pursue it is I, I think coaching is so boring. <laughs> the the doing of the coaching. I really admire you coaches for being able to hang in there and do it because it, it. So that's why I just said, okay, I've I've thought of it. I know it's helpful, but I don't want to do it. Hey, you you figured out your strengths right. and your interests and your right, passions. Exactly. Exactly. I, I would be a very bad coach. Aw, well, you're yeah. a great doctor. So how can people get in touch with you if they want to get treated for ADHD around the country, around the world? Sure, but yeah, my website is uh, drhallowell.com. And, you know, I have offices in Boston, New York, Palo Alto, and Seattle. But my books contain most of what I know. So between my books and my website, you can get a lot of information. And I know you have really good TikToks. Oh, yeah, I've got TikToks, yes. <laughs> the most important thing is to embrace it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't think of it as efficiency. That deficit disorder is a terrible term. You know, even the three core symptoms, you turn them on its head and you get a positive. The flip side of distractibility is curiosity, mm-hmm. a major asset. The flip side of impulsivity is creativity, another major asset. You don't plan to have a creative idea. They pop. They come impulsively. And the flip side of hyperactivity is energy. You know, I'm glad at my age to have all the energy I've got. So embrace the condition. As I like to say, you unwrap the gift. It doesn't unwrap itself. It takes work to unwrap this gift. 
And obviously for adults, the two most important things, marry the right person, find the right job. Oh, yeah. You don't have to marry the right person, but make your primary partner, you know, someone who loves you and supports you. And, uh, and then the right job, something you're good at that you like to do. Usually, usually it's some kind of entrepreneurial interest, but it doesn't have to be. And, and I ca- count artists as being entrepreneurs. You know, you're trying to grow a piece of art with, as opposed to growing a business. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time on Successful with ADHD. It's a pleasure to talk. Well, thank you for what you do, Brooke. I, I think it's wonderful that you, uh, that you took the initiative and did this. This is a perfect example of, of just terrific. Good for you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Successful with ADHD. I hope it helps you on your journey. And if you need any additional support for you or a loved one with ADHD, feel free to reach out to us at coachingwithbrook.com and all social media platforms at Coaching with Brooke. And remember, it's Brooke with an E. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.